Hey, thanks for joining us online today. We believe that Jesus wants to do so much through you and for you, and we'd love to hear about how he's working in your life. Please take a second to email your story to stories at rise-church.com. We hope this message leaves you feeling uplifted and encouraged. Enjoy. Come on, we are kicking off a brand new series today. Come on, give yourselves a hand. You already have perfect attendance. Come on. And this is just a three-week series. And so if you come every week of this series, we're going to give little perfect attendance ribbons um, to everybody in this place. And some of y'all are like, really? I never got one of those. (laughs) Raise your hand if you never got perfect attendance in school. Like, never. Raise your hand if you did. We hate you. Yeah. Yeah. You got, yeah, you, listen, you got straight C's, but you like owned that perfect attendance ribbon like you were king and queen. My senior year of high school, I actually missed the most days you could miss without failing and still rocked that 4.0. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Well, I'm pumped up about this series. We're calling it Dig In, Dig In, and we are looking at the stories that Jesus told. Um, I love Jesus, and I love reading the Bible, and anytime Jesus was teaching, he always had a crowd show up. I think part of that was because he was doing some super crazy miracles, and people were like, I want to get in on that. Uh, But I think also Jesus knew how to speak to an audience. I think he knew how to relate to the crowd that he was talking to. Um, The way that we say it around here is that we like to put the cookies on the bottom shelf to where everybody can get one. I have sat as a preacher and a teacher and a pastor, I have sat and listened to too many pastors preach what sound like really good sermons, but I don't understand any of it. And if I don't understand it, you probably don't too. And so we just try to make things super relatable. And I think Jesus was the master storyteller. I think he really could just captivate an audience. I think he knew how to get on people's levels. He would oftentimes talk about things that everybody understood. And and I think that he, he knew the art of telling a good story. I love stories. I love stories that make you cry. I really love stories that make you laugh. I got a story to tell you. I actually got two stories to tell you this morning. If you laugh at the first one, I'll tell you the second one. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. So I heard a story about a pastor that preached at his church, and on one particular Sunday morning, his six-year-old daughter was sitting in the worship experience, and normally she was in the kids' area, but she chose to sit in, and before this pastor would ever preach his message, he would bow his head for just a moment, and then he would jump into the message. Afterwards, they went home, and the six-year-old little girl looked at her dad and said, Dad, I noticed that before you start to preach your message that you bowed your head for a moment. What, What was that all about? And the pastor, the dad, was impressed. You know, his daughter was so observant that she noticed that. And he said to her, well, honey, you know, before I start preaching, I always ask God to make it good. Daughter looked back at him and said, well, why didn't he? (laughs) That's funny, man. I don't care who you are. (laughs) All right, that's good. All right, here's the second one. Second one's about two brothers. Two brothers, I Let's put them eight and 10 years old and just got in trouble all the time. And the parents are just like, what do we do with these kids? Maybe we should send them to church and have a meet with the pastor. Maybe he can help. And if you're sitting here today and you got two little kids and you don't know what to do with them, don't call me. I ain't helping you. That's, you got to go through that on your own. Hey, and so they, they meet with the pastor and the pastor says, all right, I'll meet with the boys, but I want to meet with them individually. And I want to meet with the younger brother first. So he brings the younger brother into his office. He sits him down and he looks at him and he says, where is God? Little boy didn't say anything. Pastor looked at him again and said, where is God? Little boy, still nothing. Finally, the pastor got upset because the boy wasn't speaking. And he looked at the kid and said, where is God? Little boy ran out of the office as fast as he could, ran all the way home, got in his bedroom, got in the closet. Older brother walks in and says, what is going on? And the little boy looks at his older brother and says, I don't know what's going to happen, but God's missing and they think that we did it. (laughs) Oh, man. You'll get it in just a second. You'll get it. Oh, yeah, I get it. I love Jesus. He is uh, the master storyteller. He, he, 
he teaches in what we call parables or what the Bible calls parables. And really a parable just was a, a spiritual lesson um, that had great meaning. Um, and so you could hear it on the surface, but there was always a deeper meaning to it. Sometimes Jesus spoke in parables to actually hide that deeper meaning from other people because he wanted people to dig in, dig in and really hear what he was saying. See, there's some of y'all that are in this place today and you showed up and you really are just here because somebody asked you to come and you're not really gonna listen and you don't really want to listen. And that's okay, there's no condemnation. We're glad you're here. Um, then there's another group of you that you're ready, man. You're like, God, say something to me right now. I wanna, I wanna hear from you. Like I'm, I, my heart is open to, to listen. And then there's a whole nother group of you that you literally have notes out right now. And you got that white piece of paper that we give you every single Sunday in the seat back that you're sitting in right now. And then the pins, the blue big pins that you steal every week from our church, they're there. And you, you, not only do you want God to say something to you now, you want to write it down right now so you can take it with you. We encourage note taking in this house. I always love when I say, write this down and y'all just look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Writing it in my head, pastor, I got it right here. <laughs> no, write it down, come on. And stop stealing the pens. All right, so listen. <laughs> Jesus, he just, like, all throughout his life, like, he would just tell these parables. Uh, my favorite parable he ever told, um, I'm not preaching on it today, but it's my favorite one. It's in Luke 15. And it's a story of two brothers. And specifically, he talks about the younger brother first. And he says that this, this younger brother goes up to his dad and says, hey, dad, I want my inheritance, which is basically the younger brother telling the dad, hey, dad, I wish you were dead right now so that I could get all the money you're going to leave me. So why don't you just go ahead and give it to me? And the father should have been offended by that, should have beat his kid upside the head, but instead gives him the money. The younger son takes the money, goes off to another town, another country, spends it all, wastes it, partying, doing whatever, finds himself living amongst pigs. And the Bible says that he comes to his senses one day and he says, I wonder if my dad would take me back. He prepares this long speech of how he's going to ask for forgiveness from his dad. But the Bible says this, that when the son was coming back to the father, that the father saw him from a long way off and ran to his son. And when he got to his son, he said, I told you so. How could you do that? No, 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 no. He didn't say that. He started hugging his son. He started, it got weird. He started kissing his son. He just was like, come on. Yes, my son's home. He starts calling to all the servants in the house. Go get that big fat cow. We're going to kill that thing. We're going to make some steaks and some burger. We're going to do some tacos. Come on, whatever we can get. Cinco de Mayo. Come on, give me a reason to eat some tacos, somebody. Thank you. And they throw a party for this young son that had wasted his life. But the father loved his son so much that he was just glad that he was home. Now this story represents God is the father. We are the son. And it doesn't matter what you've done, your father loves you and will always continue to run towards you. But then there's an older brother and the older brother gets mad at the dad. Why are you throwing him a party? Don't you remember what he did? I've been here the whole time. I've never done anything. I didn't ask for my inheritance. I'm waiting on it like I should. Why haven't you thrown me a party? The older son represents the religious people who used to be the younger son, forgot where they came from, and now they look down on other people. May we never be that church. May we never be a church that goes, well, how could they? Look at the lifestyle that they're living. No, 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 no. Everybody is welcomed in this place. Every single person. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you're currently doing. I don't care what your lifestyle is. You're welcome here. We might not agree with each other, but there is always a seat for you in this house. And we want to point you to Jesus. We want to point you to the Father whose arms are always open wide, ready to receive you in. And so that's the parable in Luke 15. Go read it. I preach it once a year at our church. It's probably time I preach it again. There's three stories, a story of a lost sheep, a story of a lost coin, and the lost son. But that's not what I'm preaching today. Today, I'm preaching one verse. 
It's the shortest parable in the entire Bible. It's found in Matthew 13. You can go ahead and turn there if you got a Bible. If you don't have one, it'll be up on the screen. Now, I need to tell you this. I was teaching something different. I was teaching a whole other parable today, and I felt like this week God put something different on my heart. I said, God, I don't know. This message I got's already pretty good. Are you sure you want me to preach that? He said, yeah, I'm sure. I got something better. I said, all right, if you say so. And so that's what I want to share with you today. I hope that you're ready to receive it. I believe that God is going to speak something into your heart. If you are ready, say, I'm ready. Matthew 13, verse 44, it says this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had, and he bought the field. Now, I studied this because this is only one verse. And so you got to kind of study and kind of know what's the context, what's Jesus trying to say here. And I read other articles that other pastors had written about this verse and how they broke it down. And I even listened to other messages of what pastors and preachers were saying about this verse. And pretty much they were all saying the same thing. But then I found a thread that kind of went a different way. And I want to share that with you. And I want to bring some clarity to this parable this morning. Because I heard a few pastors kind of present it in this way. That the man in the story represents Jesus. That the field is the world. And do not clap yet because I need to bring you in and just let you know what's going on. And the treasure is us. That Jesus sacrificed everything. That he gave up everything for us. And that's good preaching. And it's actually pretty accurate. That Jesus did give every, I mean, he gave his life for us. And that we are, in essence, a treasure. Because if Jesus gave his life for you, that must mean that you have value. So if you walked in here feeling worthless today, that's not from God, that's from the enemy. Jesus would not have died on the cross for you if you were worthless. I don't care what anybody has said to you. But I need to bring some clarity. Make no mistake about it. In this story, we are not the treasure. Jesus is and will always be and has always been the treasure. He is the treasure. <laughs> Jesus is the greatest thing in this life. He is the giver of life. He is the giver of joy. He is the hope of the world. He is the prince of peace. There is no one like him. You're not clapping, so I'll amen myself. Preach, Adam, that is good. Come on, pastor. Sorry, right, it's too late. It's too late. In 1962, we're going back. Come on, raise your hand if you were rocking life in 1962. Come on, somebody, yeah. Yeah. You're going to know, you're going to be able to track with me. Others of you, you're going you're gonna to kind of know just through the years, you're going to get caught up on this. In 1962, CBS launched a new television show about a backwoods family. I think they were from Middleburg. No, <laughs> no offense if you're from the Berg, all right? And the whole point of the show was about a man named Jed. He was a poor mountaineer that barely kept his family fed. But then one day, he was shooting at some food, and up from the ground came a bubbling crew. Come on, somebody. Oil, that is. Black gold. Texas tea. Now, all the young people are like, what just happened? Come on, raise your hand if you've ever heard of the Beverly Hillbillies. Yeah. How many of y'all watched that show back in the day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now some of y'all, y'all didn't know it was a TV show. You just knew it was an amazing movie with Ernest in it, right? Come on, yeah. <laughs> it was a terrible movie. <laughs> the whole premise of the show was this, that there's this country family, and they live out in the woods, and all of a sudden, he's out there, you know, hunting for food, like the majority of you do here on the west side, you know, like, gotta eat tonight, honey. Like, <laughs> I, <laughs> We are not that church yet. Yeah, half of y'all maybe. And he's out shooting for food and shoots in the ground and boom, oil pops up. And in a moment, everything changed for the Clampets. 
They packed up all their stuff. They moved to Beverly Hills. The show was called the Beverly Hillbillies. I believe with all of my heart, hear me, some of you walked in this place today and you're gonna leave changed because a moment's gonna happen for you today where your eyes and your heart is open to who Jesus is. And you're going to realize he is the treasure that I have been looking for my entire life. And I didn't even know it. So maybe you're here today and you've already experienced the love of Jesus. We want that treasure of who he is to just grow even more in your life. And maybe you're here and you didn't realize Jesus was the treasure. Man, we want you to say yes to a relationship with him today. Jesus was telling this story, this parable, to, to some of his closest followers, really. I find it very ironic that he's, he's teaching this parable to guys that have actually lived it out. You know the story, like Jesus, uh, you know, steps into the world at age 30, and he starts doing his public ministry, and, and he starts getting some guys to follow him. And one of the first guys that he goes up to is a guy named Peter. And he walks up to Peter, and he says, hey, Peter. And Jesus, you know, he was the kind of guy that just wasn't afraid to ask for anything. Anybody know somebody like that? We got a guy on our staff, like, he is not afraid to ask for anything. We'll go out to a restaurant, and he'll order a cheeseburger, and be like, can I, can I get another burger, like, for free? Like, is it free, like, free burger night? Like, can I, like, he will literally, but can I get some extra, extra fries, free fries? Yeah, yeah. And then they'll give it to him. I don't understand. He's got a cute face. I don't know what it is. But he'll ask, and if you don't ask, you're not going to get it. And so Jesus looks at Peter, and he's like, hey, Peter, bro, um, hey, man, can I, can I use your boat? Can I, can I get in your boat? And Peter's like, yeah, yeah, sure, Jesus, come on. And then Jesus says, hey, um, man, let's go fishing. Let, let's go out and, and catch some fish. And Peter looks at Jesus and like, hey, listen, Jesus, hey, just heard you teach, man. Solid, awesome. Um, but I've been fishing my whole life. We actually just got back from fishing. Uh, didn't catch anything. They're not biting tonight. Jesus says, no, 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 it's cool, man. Let, let's go out, let's throw the nets, let's see what, let's see what happens. And, and Peter says, yes, all right, let's do it. And they go out and they throw the nets in the water and the Bible says they catch so many fish, the boat actually begins to sink. They have to signal over another boat. Peter's looking around going, man, we are balling now. Like, we're eating fish for weeks. We're gonna sell some of this fish. Like, it's gonna be, it is on. And he's amazed and he looks at Jesus and Jesus says, hey, you think that's cool? I got something that I'm gonna do in you that's gonna blow you away. Hey, Peter, you're not gonna fish for fish anymore. You're gonna start fishing for people. And he says, I want you to follow me. And the Bible says that Peter immediately dropped his nets, everything that he knew, and he went and he followed Jesus. Now, here's the reality. Some of you are in this place today, and there are some things that Jesus is asking you to drop in your life because he has something better for you. I'm talking about some unhealthy friendships. Some of you are in this place today and you got some friends that you've been hanging out with your entire life, but you're going after Jesus and they're not. Now, I'm not telling you just to drop them and never talk to them again. I'm just telling you, you might not need to continue to spend that much time with them because they are not a good influence on your life. Somebody else in here, it's not a friendship. It's actually a dating relationship. It is not healthy. He tells you that he loves you, but if he loved you, he wouldn't treat you that way. She tells you that she loves you, but if she loved you, she wouldn't treat you that way. And if you're sitting here today and you're like, he finally said it. Pastor said it. I can leave my husband. That is not what I'm saying. You are stuck, all right? Listen, figure it out. I'm talking about people that hadn't made that jump yet. Like, don't go down that route if you know that this isn't the person that is not God's best for you. Some of you are in an unhealthy workplace. I'm not telling you to quit your job either. I'm just saying if you know God's leading you out of it, don't stay where you know you're not supposed to be. And so for some people, it's God telling you drop it and go. For other people, it's God telling you, hey, don't drop it and go. You need to stay exactly where you are. You just need to go at it with a greater passion. You need to stay exact. That's for my marriage, people. Hey, listen, you don't need to bail on your marriage. You need to dig in. 
Pray more for them. Love them more. Forgive them more. Dig into that relationship and watch what God will do. But what is God saying to you? What, what is he calling you to do? In, in the Bible, it kind of talks through this whole idea of before Christ we were dead and then Jesus makes us alive, which is a really cool thing if you think about it. Before Jesus, we are bankrupt spiritually. Like we have nothing and then Jesus comes in and he meets us at our greatest need, at our greatest need of poverty. He comes in and he changes things and he brings something new in our life. It's incredible. There's no one else that can do for you what Jesus can do for you. You can try to accumulate massive amounts of wealth. You can get nicer houses, bigger houses, newer cars, finer clothes, whatever you want. The Bible says do all of that and in the end you're still gonna be left empty because those things cannot fulfill you. The Bible actually says these words. You can try to gain the entire world, but in the process, you'll lose your soul. And we just got to come around this idea right here that the treasure of Jesus makes you wealthy because it pays off all of your debt. All of your debt. Listen, some of you are going to go out to lunch after church today. And when you get done eating, your waiter or waitress is going to put the check on the table. You have to pay that. It's frowned upon if you don't. Somebody's got to pay the bill. When it comes to your sin, somebody's got to pay the bill. You can try to pay it yourself. You can't. Or you can let Jesus pay it for you. Let him pay your bill. When I was growing up, my dad, if he saw a penny on the ground, he'd get it. Anybody like you, that you're that person, like if you see a penny on the ground, you're picking it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you are like, I ain't bending down for nothing less than a quarter? Like, <laughs> I want to see some shine on that thing. Dollars only. Like, so, like a quarter? Pff, I don't need that. <laughs> my dad... Anywhere we went, pick up a penny, put it in his pocket. My dad would go out of his way if he saw a penny on the ground. That looks like a penny over there underneath that snack machine. And he'd get on the floor and he'd grab that penny. As a kid, I'm just like, Dad, it's not worth it. Like, come on, man. Until he brought me into his closet one day and said, hey, I want to show you something. And he showed me jugs and jars of pennies. Eight or ten of them, just filled to the top of pennies. And he looked at me and he said, those are all going to be yours one day. (laughs) Thanks. I already got a game. My kids are going to roll them up. They're going to be there for days just rolling pennies. Dad, can I stop? No. We're going to have five dollars after. I mean, we're going to be able to retire off those pennies one day. I used to think it wasn't worth it, picking up those pennies. Somebody's in here today and you think that following Jesus isn't worth it. Because you look at all the things that you think you have to give up to follow after him. You look at him and you think, well, to get the treasure, you're telling me that I got to say no to all of this stuff. It's not worth it. It's because your focus is on the wrong thing. I I preached a sermon probably over two years ago when we were still at Eagle's View. And I entitled it, It's Not the From, It's the Two. It's not the from, it's the two. It's not about what you're turning from. It's about who you get to turn to. So if your focus is only on the things that you think you have to turn from, you're going to lose sight of who you get to turn to. This is Jesus, the one that gave his life for you, the one that spilled his blood for you, the one that resurrected from the grave all for you. Oh, yeah, but all this stuff looks really good. Oh, my gosh. It pales in comparison to Jesus. It would be like you eating chicken McNuggets from McDonald's your entire life. And then all of a sudden, a friend of yours says, hey, I want to take you to a new restaurant. 
is called Chick-fil-A. Come on, somebody. Christian chicken, right? Lord, we're going to eat Chick-fil-A in heaven. It's going to be with Krispy Kreme donuts as the bun. It's going to be glorious. And you walk into Chick-fil-A and you order a box of nuggets and you put it in your mouth and you go, what is this? And your friend looks at you and says, that's chicken. (laughs) And you realize in a moment that what you've been eating your entire life at Mickey D's, ain't nothing wrong with Mickey D's. Some of y'all are going there today. My wife probably is. Listen, nothing wrong with it. But what you realize in that moment is that what you've been eating is not the real thing. When you've tasted the real thing, you know the difference. Listen, the world is not offering you the real thing. What it offers will leave you empty. Jesus is the treasure. He is the real thing. And when you've experienced him, you know the difference. Psalm 34, 8 says this, taste and see that the Lord is is, come on, say it with me, good. Oh, he's good. But here's the problem. Even for some of you in this place, you don't think that the Lord is good because you've met Christians. I'll even say it like this because they might not be Christians. You've met religious people that have put a bad taste in your mouth of who God is. That's why so many of you in our church haven't been to church in 10 years. You didn't want to come to church because the church put a bad taste in your mouth of who God is. And when you can come around this idea, this is why I believe, man, like you got friends, man, come on, get them through our doors just one time. They might not walk out believing what we believe, but they will have tasted and seen that God's good. They'll have heard about the love of Jesus that cares for them, that he's not mad at them. He's good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Reminds me of the day that I met my wife. In that moment, I put every other woman on this planet on notice. I'm taken. That is my woman. I'm sorry, ladies. I am off the market. And I took the advice of my good friend, Beyonce. I liked it, so I put a ring on it. And it would be foolish of me to look and go, yeah, but look at everything that I'm giving up. Look at all these other great women that are out here. Ah, y'all are great, ladies. You're awesome. But I have found the one that I want to spend the rest of my life with going on 12 years of marriage. I love that girl more than I ever have before. And I would be a fool to look at everything else and go, oh, but look, look what I came from. Look at all that. No, 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 no. Because my eyes are focused on who I get to go to. That's Jesus. That's, that, that's why it's easy, follower of Jesus, to, to say, yeah, I used to think it wasn't worth it. But then like Jesus like came into my life and I realized, oh man, you are everything that I've been looking for. So I will gladly drop all of that to go after you. I wrote this down. When you experience the goodness of God, you don't have to search for anything else because everything you need is found in him. I can remember a couple years ago at our old house, I was playing out, this is when we only had two kids, playing out in the front yard with my kids. And I hear this glorious sound. Maybe you've heard it before. Yes. Oh, praise the Lord. And if you're sitting there and you don't know what that sound is, you can come repent at the end of church. That is the sound of the ice cream truck. And I'm playing out in the front yard with my kids and my wife's sitting there on the porch watching us play and we heard that music come on. My wife and I had probably only been married for nine years at this point, but we had that unspoken thing going on already. You know what I'm talking about? Where you can just look at them 
And I looked at my wife and without speaking a word to each other, that look she gave me was, you know what to do. (laughs) And in that moment, I took off. I didn't see the truck. I just heard the music. And I took off running as fast as I could, chasing a complete stranger in a sketchy truck buying ice cream that I don't know what this guy has done with it. But in that moment, my eyes and every focus and everything that I had was for my wife and for my kids and for myself to partake in some ice cream. It just tastes better from the truck. Can I get an amen? Amen. We teach our kids, don't talk to strangers, but we will hawk a ice cream truck down. (sighs) This is my prayer. This is, this is my prayer for you today. This is why I know this is the message that God gave me. Some of you, you have not tasted and seen that God is good. And so you're not running after him. My prayer is that God would grab your heart today and change you. Follower of Jesus, you have tasted and seen, but you're still holding on to something over here that's keeping you from fully running after him. And and I'm not going to tell you what that thing is. You already know it. The Holy Spirit talks to you about it because your thing's different than his thing and her thing and my. We have a mission statement of our church. It'll be up here. We exist. We will be a church that leads people to love God with all of their heart. That's the goal. I don't care if you've been following Jesus your entire life or you've been following him for a few weeks or months. We want everybody in this house to love God with everything they got. I want you to love God with all of your heart. I want you to know that he is the treasure. And I want you to be able to look and go, well, now that I've seen the treasure, God, it's easy. I will gladly, I'll give up anything you want. Sometimes the things that you give up, it is sin in your life. And God is calling you out because he has something better. Sometimes it's not even sin. It's just things that distract you. So come on, follower of Jesus, what is it? What's he calling you? Come on, he's the treasure. There's nothing better. We know that. So come on, let's run after him. Come on, let's grow in our desire and our pursuit of God and the things of God. Let him be the center of everything. Let him be weaved through the pattern of our lives and our families and our workplaces and our school students everywhere. Come on, Jesus. May you be the greatest desire of our hearts. And if you're in this place and you don't know Jesus, in just a moment, we're gonna give you an opportunity to respond. Because he is the greatest treasure. And you have been searching for something. And today for the first time you're realizing that what you've been searching for is Jesus. And he brought you here today because he loves you. And he wants to change everything in your life. Thanks for watching today. If you'd like to continue the conversation, you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram. If our church has had an impact on you and you'd like to support what Jesus is doing here, you can do so by going to rise-church.com slash give and select the giving option that best suits you. Thanks for watching online and have a great week.